Uh, this is John Gibbons, and you're listening to the great show, The Walk Off with Scott and Adam. So excited to be joined by today's guest, former MLB catcher and two time manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, John Gibbons. Welcome to The Walk Off, man. Thanks so much for taking the time. Hey, my pleasure. You know, I'm glad uh, I'm glad we're hooking up here. You know, when you start to say two time manager uh, of the Blue Jays, I, I was kind of, for some reason, I envisioned you were going to say two time manager of the year, and I'm going, Damn, that would have been nice. <laughs> that would have been nice. But if I, still, if I'd won one, yeah, if I'd won one of those, I might still be doing it. Who knows? <laughs> hey, two-time manager is better than two-time in manager. So you got that, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, so, Gibby, we're so excited to have you on and talk some Blue Jays and baseball. By the way, uh, just a tip of the hat to you because Twitter, 10 times better now that you're on it. I just love seeing your baseball takes daily. <laughs> was it was it that boring beforehand or what? <laughs> oh, it was nothing before you got there. <laughs> uh, who's the guy? Who's the guy? Uh, I thought I thought Elon Musk was was he was he going to buy Twitter? Was that was he going to buy or was he going to buy? Oh yeah, he was going to buy Twitter. Oh, okay. and then, yeah, and that kind of killed it or what? <laughs> All right, my man, let's start with uh, some big news for you. I know you announced just a couple days ago on social media there, your memoirs, Gibby, Tales of a Baseball Life, are out April 4th, 2023. Congrats. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of cool. You know, it's, it's kind of funny how it all happened. You know, I've told the story a hundred times. People going, really? But, you know, book. Or the people that really know me well, I grew up with really a book, you know. Uh, <laughs> so when I was leaving and or fired, whatever you want to call it, in 18, you know, a couple of the well, probably a handful of them said, you know, if you ever write a book, the writers that cover the team, I want to write it. And I'm thinking, really? Really? That's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I joke about it now, it's, but it's going to actually be a coloring book. But uh, <laughs> no, what, what, so what happened is I said, nah, you know, because I mean, in, in all seriousness, I thought, I, I don't know who would re- read it because I, you know, you know, my, my, my career has been, in my opinion, has been kind of, you know, just kind of steady Eddie, nothing real, you know, <laughs> jumps out at you. But they said, no, you'd be surprised. So anyway, like time went by, and eventually I got in touch with a buddy of mine that had a book written, and one thing led to another. It was kind of fun putting it all together, you know, you know looking back on, you know, the days of my family and primarily baseball, the 40 years, and uh, it's kind of kind of fun to reminisce. So anyway, yeah, that'll be out next April. We'll, uh, well, I hope people enjoy it. Let's We'll find out. I'm excited for it, man. And I, I love that you're putting out a podcast, too. I know you start that next week, uh, which is kind of funny because, like you said, after you finished managing, you were fairly off the baseball radar. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're on social media, you're announcing a book, you're doing a podcast. Is this like one of those uh, just when you think you're out, they pull you back in type of things? Well, well you yeah. know. There's a part to that story too. Well, you know, when you, the, the, the guys who are doing the book are one, well, the, the, it's the same group. And they said, let's, why don't we do a podcast? You know, it's like, I go on, I've been on different shows and enjoy just talking baseball. Right. And uh, they said, why don't you do a podcast? Everybody's doing one. And I said, so uh, all right. But they said, okay, if you're going to do that and you got a book, you got, you, you probably ought to be on social media. And I said, no way. Right. They said, yeah, you probably do. Cause, cause if anybody's ever want going to want to sponsor it, they have to, you know, they have to have some verification that people listen or whatever, whatever. Right. So I said, all right. So then, uh, you know, I'd been on Facebook a few years ago and that got me in trouble and I got tired of that, you know? And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so here I am again. And I had, you know, I always got to check with my kids, make sure I know what I'm doing the right things and uh, make sure I don't, uh, put something out there that hangs me or something, you know, but, <laughs> don't need to be canceled. No, <laughs> no. So, so I, I, I battle it. I've tried to figure it out. I Google every now and then, how do you do this or that? And, uh, it's been kind of fun though. It's been, it really has been fun to reconnect, you know? Uh, uh, and I'm, and I'm shocked uh, at the response I've got gotten, if you want to know the truth. And it's been, it's been pretty cool. Oh, it's been a celebration in Jay's nation since you've shown your head again. Is it weird being famous in a country that isn't your own like i know you might you might say you're not famous but in 2015 in the streets of toronto gibby you were a rock star and i know we even had uh very lucky he was very generous with his time jamie campbell of sportsnet on the show in the off season and he was talking about how you guys went to uh moose jaw for the sports moose. fundraiser yeah. there moose jaw yeah. saskatchewan and you were the <laughs> bell of the ball are you used to being canadian famous yet no, you know, you know what? It, I I fell in love with that place. You know, I I really did. It. And you know, when I my father was in the U.S. military, right? One of his assignments was Goose Bay, Labrador, um, up in Newfoundland. 
And we were there for uh, like three years up there in, you know, Greenland, Iceland, whatever it was, way up there. So that was my, that was my first introduction to uh, Canada. And I played my first baseball game there ever, you know, as a little link. So I have that connection. Uh, and then there's just something about it, you know, and, and I don't want, I don't want to insult Canadians by any means, but it's like, you know, I felt like I was one of them, you know, in a lot of ways, certain things I was a lot alike, you know? And uh, so, uh, you know, I was there for, gosh, 10, 12, 13 years, but 10 as a manager and a couple of years as a coach. So I was there a good portion of my life and I uh, really fell in love with the place. Um, so, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know if I look at it as famous, but it's amazing how, you know, you, you after 23 years, I think it was, you finally start winning some games. People <laughs> love you. <laughs> yeah. Funny how that works. You know, Winning goes a long ways, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So obviously we're thrilled you've joined us on the show, but our listeners have lost their mind that you're doing the podcast. We got dozens and dozens of questions for him. We're not going to get to them all. We'll try and get to as many listeners questions as we can, but there was one that came up multiple times. So I figured we'd, we'd get to that one here. Cause I want to yeah. know it too. Uh, you were the manager of the blue Jays. Like we touched on two different stints. What changed in your personal managerial approach, philosophies, styles between those two tenures? Uh, better players. <laughs> no, that's it. No, that's it. You know, hey, come on, guys. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's, there's no, it's no, there's no secrets in professional sports, really in sports anywhere, right? If you got good players, you're probably going to win, or you got a better chance of winning. And, um, uh, but to answer your, your question, uh, seriously, or well, I'm serious. My answer there, but <laughs> you know what? Um, <clears throat> Like, did you chill out at all? Like, was like what personally changed? Was there, or were you the same manager? Yeah, well, you, well, you know, experience teaches you everything. I mean, experience does wonder. I don't care what your profession is, right? You know, I mean, you, and if you don't learn from things, you know, you're not probably not going to be very good. And so, there's no question uh, that you know uh, I've been through the rigors before. I knew how to deal with the media. You know, I had a couple dust ups my first go round with players and. <laughs> Although I don't really regret that that happened. I regret that it was out in the open, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as chilling, you know what? Uh, when, sometimes the, the, the group of players you got, you know, you can relax a little bit more with than, than you know, than other groups, right? Uh, and it's, and it's, it's, but it's so true. You know, you, I mean, the, the more talent you have, the better year you're having. You know, things, things, get, things can blow up on you, but if you're having a good season, you know, everything just kind of, falls by the wayside and forgotten or it's covered up, whatever. Right. So when a team's going bad, having a bad year, every little thing is magnified and everything's out in the open and, uh, you know, everybody starts picking each other apart. So, um, so, you know, like I said, more success that second go around, uh, changed me in a better way. Put it that way. It's funny because we had, speaking of the dust up, uh, <laughs> we actually had Shea Hillenbrand on the show and Gibby, uh. he, he felt he, he talks about it like it's one of the biggest regrets of his life, the dust up that you two had. So uh, in the end, you know, it uh, probably helped him grow as a person even. <laughs> you know, I, I like shit, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm still rooting for him. It really, that's one of those things that, it, 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 and that you know, the, the way it happened, you know, he went, went for a few days and it was, I was looking out for the guy, right? And, but I understand his frustrations. Uh, you know, he was frustrated. I think when he came to Toronto, the fact that he, he was a DH where he's used to playing the field, you know, mm -hmm. we had Troy Gloss playing third and, and, uh, but we tried to get him out there as much as possible, but that's kind of was the deal. I don't blame him one bit, you know, because he's, he's got a few years left and he, he doesn't want to be labeled. Right. So, um, but yeah, you know, I, I heard he's doing really good and I'm happy that I have not talked to him. Uh, you know, I think it'd be great sometimes, but there's, there's no, there's no hard ill feelings from my end of it, but you know, I kind of grew up, you know, when, when my old man raised me, you know, uh, sometimes you got, you know, you got to fight fire with fire, man. You got to take things head on sometimes, you know, and that that's not always a good thing, you know, and that's not always the best thing in this politically correct world we live in, but you know, I guess you are who you are. Hey, you know? There's an idea for an episode for one of your podcasts. You get Shea Hillenbrand back on. You guys got a way of tracking them down. All right, we'll put you. Oh, in you touch. bet. We'll give you our contacts if you give us yours. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. 
So, Gibby, you have managed uh, and coached hundreds, maybe even thousands of players between minor leagues and big leagues by this time. Uh, and you always hear about pregame rituals and superstitious routines. Well, what's some of the weirdest things that you've seen done in a clubhouse in the name of good juju? Gosh, you know, that's, 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 I should, they should just be able to roll off my tongue, but I, I gotta, you know, I gotta be honest when, when the, uh, you know, I've always, you know, the, the clubhouse is the players, right? The managers and the coaching, they're down there. Right. And I try to stay out of there as much as possible because hey, that's, that's their domain. Right. You know, I'm, I'm out there pre games and during the game with them, they, they like a little breathing room. They say, and you know what? Boys will be boys or whatever, 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 you know, and I don't want to be a part of all of it, right? Uh, I'm trying to be a little more mature. <laughs> anyway, uh, so so I wouldn't venture out there very rarely before before a game or especially, you know, when they're getting ready. So if I get if I had time to give it a lot of thought, I could probably come up with something. But there was no, you know, there was no like uh, really something to go, you go, wow, you know. But but guys are superstitious and, you know, the, you know, you get the basic things, the boring things, well, you know, you know, if they, you know, obviously if they, if they, if they're on a roll, man, they're going to do every, the same damn thing they did, <laughs> you know, until, until it runs out, whether it's the way they dress or, or where the, uh, where the food they eat. I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, yeah, it can be a little, it can be, it can definitely be a little mental when you go, geez, but you know, baseball players are so, so mind oriented, you know, they, they have to be so, uh, uh, tough minded and, and uh, be able to control that, that, doesn't surprise me that they a little bit OCD a lot of them you know oh yeah especially when they're on the a hot streak or a, a cold streak like we all saw them uh this Jays team just like what was it two weeks ago when they were in that uh offensive black hole and just couldn't seem to put up runs and they all had their hats and just like shaking their hats right trying to get anything going right <laughs> you know you know I, I, you will find in, in baseball now it's, it's probably sports all over the it's it's so different uh, the things like that you're talking about or, or the celebrations with home runs. And, and, you know, back when I was coming up and, and, and uh, got to pro ball and all that, you didn't have any of that, you know, I mean, it was, you know, it was almost like you're doing all that celebrating the other teams and the other side, they're, they're, they're fired up. They're stewing, man. They're, they're ready to get a piece of you, you know, <laughs> but now it is now it's like a big celebration. And, I, and a lot of it's, you know, everybody's in a, uh, uh, you know, they, they like to, you know, they show their emotions and all that. It's been good for the game. And that's kind of the, the, uh, the generation now. Uh, but it, uh, you know, as far as like the rolling the hats, you know, they used to see that college teams used to do yeah. that, you know, you never saw it in pro ball. Now, now they're doing it, you know, now with the blue Jays with the jackets or some, or some teams ringing the bell with the chain. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or putting the ball down, putting the guy in a cart and wheeling him. You know, I, I got no problem. You celebrating all that. I just have a problem is if you if you're down by eight to ten runs, maybe we shouldn't be doing it. You know, out of respect to the out of respect to the people that paid for the tickets. You know, that's yeah. my only beef right there. So, speaking yeah. of generations and just the difference of it, even your two stints of managing, the game changed a pile between your those two stints. Like analytic departments around the league double, tripled, maybe quadrupled in size between those two times. Uh, how did you balance the information of both like the analytical side and of course, like your instinctual stuff. And when you look back, what would you say the biggest differences between managing a team in 2006 and managing a team in 2016 was? Okay. Well, you know, my, uh, my first go around JP Richard, he hired me and, and JP came from Oakland, you know, and B Billy Bean out there with Moneyball. So that was kind of, uh, that was kind of taking hold. Right. And, uh, you know, of course, JP brought that to Toronto. And so, you know, you, you signed players that, you know, went up there and worked the count, you know, drew walks or hit home runs, right? And uh, and so that was the way the game was going. And really, I mean, what, what he would do, you know, the, the GM acquires the players. So he, he gives you the players and you got that kind of guy so that you run with that kind of game. You know, the big thing is, well, they, 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 made, they made sure, well, don't run yourself into outs, unnecessary outs, like by stealing bases or being overly aggressive on the base pass because the game was starting to turn into, you know, a, a home run show, right? Uh, juiced up or not, you know, it was just, it was, that's the way it was going. So, so that's, that's kind of the way the game changed there. Right. But those were your, it wasn't like you had to teach a lot of guys, well, this is a new philosophy. We got to do it because the GMs were acquiring those guys as much as possible. And the guys that were just the opposite of that, they got rid of, right? Because 
you know, they didn't buy into it or what have you. So, and then, uh, and then in a lot of ways that kind of, you know, I, I, after I was gone, I mean, that kind of faded, faded away the money ball stuff. Right. And then, uh, but, and then Alex, I mean, uh, analytics really came on onto the scene and uh, now it's every, everything's numbered. Right. But you watch a game now, you know, back, back my first goal, right. You watch a game in this, in those walks, 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 you know, guy three, two count on everybody. Now you watch a game, everybody, everybody up, up there swinging at everything almost, you know, it's like, uh, um, and I think part of it's, you know, analytics says, well, this guy's going to throw this in a certain count or this and that. So they know it's coming. So, you know, there's no more, you know, holding back, you know, plus these guys so damn hard, so, so damn hard. You better get it going <laughs> quick, you know? Uh, so, so, so an, an, analytics, I mean, both those things, it really did, really did a lot for the game. Uh, but you could see it's, it, I mean, it is different now. I mean, they say, you can, I guess you can relate money ball to this a little bit, but not totally. Uh, but, when, when my second go round, Alex Anthopoulos, you know, Alex, Alex was in, in, in the analytics. I mean, it was just kind of on the verge of taking over, but he was also smart enough to know, you know, the human element, right. That, uh, you know, these guys aren't, you know, if, if, if these guys were all robots and you were guaranteed a, a, a certain outcome because of, okay, it's one thing, but it's not, you know, the human beings and you got to factor things in and, you know, it's, a uh, you know, every pitch you make or every at bat or every game or whatever it is, things can be different. Right. So any, anyway, but that really started taking hold. And, uh, you know, once Alex left, you know, Shapiro and, and Atkins came in and, and they were, they were full board towards that. Right. Um, but, but I wasn't, you know, I used, and, you know, the thing about baseball, baseball is always, from the get go, it's always been about numbers, right. Now it's just taking it to, it to the extreme. Mm -hmm. And it's like a, a chess match, you know, whether you can move these, you know, it's, it, but that's really not the way the game is, but it's added a lot of value to it. There's no doubt because numbers don't lie, but I think it's gotten carried away to the point where every decision is based, based on, um, you know, a, a, a number, uh, you know, math. The guys you know, in the whatever. khakis making the decisions, right? Yeah. And there's been a lot of good out of that, but, but it's like, you know, uh, you know, people would say to me, well, you go buy too much by your gut and i said no i know i know i said my, my I, I trust my eyes too you know <laughs> i can i can tell when a pitcher's losing and i can i can tell when he you know uh uh you know that that kind of thing and and i guess i mean there's so much to analytics and it's been, it's been really good for the game but it drives me nuts when i watch a game now and, and um uh, you know they say well third time through a lineup you got to take these guys out right well i get it but but there's uh the, you know my eyes can also tell me that I can tell when a guy's starting to lose it. Right. But the problem with that is, and that may be perfect. I'm sure guys third time through that you got to get them out. You know, the numbers say this, but on any, the beauty of baseball on any given night, it might be that player's night. I don't, if he's a pitcher, he may be a guy just got called up or he's, you know, journeyman. He shouldn't be there. It just may happen for him. That may be his night. So you better get out of the way or something. You know, maybe a hitter he's on fire and, your your analytics says you got to pinch hit for him for this guy. No, he's having a, he's having a career night, man. Yeah. You know you'd be crazy to interfere. The baseball gods punish you. I'm telling you, they 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 do. So, um, and I can remember too a number of times that, uh, you know you you one of your pitchers is out there dealing right, and you know, the, um, and this was kind of before analytics, but you kind of relate it. And you, he may be getting tired. You can see that a little bit, but, uh, you know, he's, he's pitching a gem and it's getting late in the game. Where analytics would tell you, you, you should have taken him out an inning or two ago, right? But see, you hang on to him a little bit. But you, then you go take him out and you can almost, if you look in the other dugout, I've done it a few times. It's almost like they're going, thank you very much. You, you <laughs> Relief. Hey, hey, thank you, man. Dumbass. You're going to cost me. And you know what? The game flips like that. You know, it's kind of like that World Series game with, um, with Blake Tampa. Snow. Yeah. Right. Okay. I know, I know they did it all, all year and, and uh, uh, things like that. And I'm a huge fan of the raising Kevin cash, um, but he was done. He was dominating. Right. Yeah. And the guys coming up, I think he punched them all out twice, you know, or, or whatever. So anyway, and I, they done it most of the year. This is going to be like his last start. So he's, you know, nothing, you know, you know, he's leaving anything in the tank and then it flipped. Right. And, uh, and the, the whole idea about that is, is it, if you if if a manager had taken a, a pitcher out of a game like that years ago in a World Series, he'd have been fired the next day. Right? <laughs> Nowadays, you get fired if you don't take him out, even if you lose the World Series. You that's know what true. I mean? That's kind of the, that's kind of you know. 
So I don't know. There's, there's really no answers. It's uh, but I will tell you this, you're not getting a major league managing job now. If you, if you, if you're not willing to take your marching orders to a T with what, what the front officers want. And, you know, you know, that's, you know, that's not all, you know, they're, they're in charge. There's no doubt about it. And so, um, you know, you, you might as well live with that. I think there needs to be a little more give and take. And I think the really good ones, they, they do that. What, well, uh, sorry, no, can I jump in here? Just what, uh, cause we, we watched Charlie Montoyo get released by the blue Jays this year with John Schneider taking over. Um, but with what you're saying there with, a manager needs to be able to take his marching orders. What decisions in or 2022 willing, not, are left? To be able to, uh, he's got, he's willing to take it. Put it there. <laughs> so what, what actual responsibilities are left to a manager at this point? Like what, at what point is every decision just out of his hands? Well, you know, I, I don't know exactly, but I can tell you but when, uh, you know, at the end of my, uh, my, t- my time there, you know, they, they wish they'd, I'd use analytics more There's no doubt, but I, you know, I, I use numbers. I've been using numbers since I got there, you know, and I, as a kid, you know, you study numbers and all that. Now it's a little more extreme. There's, there's no question or a little more in depth and it has more value, obviously. But I, I, I use what I needed, what I was comfortable with and what we were having success with, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and they, and they let, they let me do that. And I tip my hat to them. Thank you. But I also knew, you know, every, every general manager that's running a team should have his own manager. And so I knew when they were coming in, you know, if, if the team, when we started going South and we were playing good at the time, it was hard, hard to switch manager. Then it, you know, things were going to change and rightfully so if I'm the general manager and I, and I want, I want my guy managing the team, you know, it, it makes things function a lot easier. So, so, uh, so I get my head, they let me do my thing. Um, but now when, when, when I, when I was cut loose and Charlie came over, I'm, I'm not sure to the extent how they dictated everything to him, but I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure they did. They, they pretty heavy handy with that. Right. And, and uh, you'd have to be, you know, you, you, I mean, really when you see all these young guys getting hired, some of them have been, have been really good players, but it used to be, and it's in what disappoints me is, you know, we talk about, you know, uh, experience is teaching you a lot of things, mm-hmm. right. You know, you used to have to pay your dues. You go down the minor leagues and, you know, manage or whatever for a number of years and you learn a lot of things about the game and the, what have you you pay your there's something to pay in your dues where you appreciate things now they're taking guys right off the street basically and put them in that role in the i guess the fact that bothers me because i know there's guys down there grinding it out that deserve a chance but but anyway um i don't know the extent that with charlie what they wanted from but i guarantee it was probably they, they wanted control of that you know mm-hmm. uh, i mean that's pretty much every ball club out there now, I would think maybe, maybe other than maybe a handful. Uh, but I don't, you know, I don't know what led to his firing. You know, usually you hear things, you know, nothing ever really got out. I, I, you know, the team was in a playoff position, right? Um, as far as Snyder, I knew John, uh, when he was coaching the minor leagues during spring training, he'd come over and, and got those the best BP of anybody on earth, right? So we'd always bring him to big league camp and he's just a tremendous guy, a good baseball guy, he kind of my, my old route. You know, I was a, kind of a journeyman catcher like he like he is and uh, we both got into coaching so um to what extent he's doing it, i've got no idea you know I, i've got no idea either but i would i mean it's a, it's you gotta you gotta figure the way the game's gone and the way that you i mean it's obvious how teams are dictating things it's the same way up there in, mm-hmm. in blue jays so to your point that maybe analytics don't tell the whole story, I know you had a tweet about a month ago about closers and that the, they're, they're just built differently. And you can take all the analytics and all the projections for getting those last three outs. But in the end, guys like Edwin Diaz, guys like Jordan Romano, they don't grow on trees. There is something different about them. What is it that makes a great closer in your mind? Why are there so many dominant eighth inning guys, but that ninth inning closer is so rare to find? You know, it's just, it's just, you know, the, a big part of it's mental toughness, you know, uh, uh, a lot of it's the carefree attitude, care less, you know, if they blow one, it's not going to eat them alive and destroy them and come back and affect them the next day where the lesser guy or, or the majority of people in baseball, you know, a, a bad at bad affects them the next at bad, or they strike out with the bases loaded. Some, a lot of most guys, at least I speaking for myself, 
that would chew up, chew me up. And you know what? It, it's, it's hanging there in the back of your head. But the great, I always said the great players, it's almost like they, part of my friends, it's like they don't give a shit, but they do. Right. <laughs> it does, you know, they know, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get another bat. That's kind of the mentality of a, a great player. And the same way with closers, you know, uh, uh, and the, the key to baseball being successful in baseball is you can slow the game down. You know, it's, you know, in, in most sports, the harder you try, you know, the better you get, you know, you can, you can run harder, hit somebody harder or more intensity, whatever baseball, the harder you try, it almost backfires on you, you know, cause you really, if you can slow it down and relax cause it's such a skill, skill game. You're, you're better off, you know? Um, so it, uh, those guys, you know, those guys in that, that ninth inning, the last the final inning, they're able to relax more. And they, you know, a big part of it is tremendous confidence, you know, even the, Roberto Osuna, who we had at the end, right. You know, got up there when he's 18, 19, and it was it turned yeah. into our closer. He wasn't even going to, he wasn't even supposed to make the team. He was going to go back and double, he was supposed to go to double A and uh, be a starter. But uh, we brought him to camp. Uh, remember Castro, right? Ca- yeah. Castro, big time. Yeah. He's still pitching, doing, doing pretty good. Castro was coming to camp. So we said, we better bring it, uh, his good buddy soon, another young kid. So he feels a little more comfortable, right? And he's not out of place. I mean, that was that was the truth. That's why he was there. Mm. You know, the, the organization had high hopes for him in the future, but not at that time. <laughs> so anyway, he comes he comes to camp, and both of them are. I don't think either one of them gave up a, a run in spring training, and looked great. But you could tell something about us sooner, right? There was just something, you know, something about him. So anyway, we start the season as, in, with uh, Castro as the closer. And he got off to a great start. I think he saved four or five in a row, you know, in, the, in some really good, tough games. And then he started to struggle a little bit. And, uh, and meanwhile, soon, I think, I don't know if he, how many innings he was even pitching. He was kind of mopping up maybe a little bit. And then it started, you could see it starting to get to Castro a little because he was he was so young and he got so frustrated. I can remember we, we were playing a game in, in Fenway and he, he'd been struggling. But, you know, we really had nobody else. We thought anyway. And he, he, we lose a game in extras in uh, Fenway. He comes in and he's snapping. He's throwing stuff. And you can just tell. It wasn't like an old veteran snapping because he's pissed off. Here's a young kid. He's, he's, he's kind of panicking, I think, because he's letting his team down, right? He's now right. he's in. So anyway, so we ended up having to, we ended up sending him down uh, to just to, just so we wouldn't lose him. And then I don't know, maybe did we, uh, maybe we tried Brett Cecil, who's, this is a good point to your argument. One of the best set of guys in the game and arguing we lost him at 15 in the playoffs. Yeah, I think he was the hottest reliever in baseball. No, he was giving up nothing. Right. But he wasn't the same guy as a closer. Why is that? Well, I don't, you know, I don't know. He was a tough guy, confident guy. There's just something different about it. So anyway, we're almost four. I don't know how it, I don't think we, we tried to sooner. We were forced to use him or something. And he took to it, man. He's like 18, 19 years old. It's like, I mean, he didn't even break a sweat, man. He kind of, you know, but I always noticed, too, pitchers that come out of Mexico, there's something different about them, man, because they're so used to playing with older players or something, and they're such skilled guys. You know, it. Uh, you know, there's just something about those guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember Esteban Loaiza, you know, when he was there, you know, this is one of the, you know, Martinez, the old Martinez with, uh, back in the day. Uh, there's just something about them. Right? Anyway, so that's my point. You know, in Roberto could blow a game. He didn't blow many of them. When he did, it's like, all right, okay, so what? Yeah. You know, you know, in 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 as a coach, and in, in, uh, it's it's kind of tough to see somebody. So was, you know, you hear all the time, well, that guy doesn't care. Well, yeah, he does care, but it's not. He's not going to. You know, it it's going to help him in the long run. It's going to help us the next day. And and uh, but, you know, so you, baseball is you know is thrown out for a, a lot of years. Well, you, you should be able to go bullpen by committee and in the uh, close games that way. No, well, yeah, you'd be ideal, but, but there's something different about it. I don't know if that's, you know, it's almost like in the military, I, yeah, I would think, you know, I, you know, I don't know, but I'm good. You know, you got the special operations guys, right? You know, they're different than the, you know, they're all heroes and they're all warriors. They're different than your, you know, your, your normal, I guess you call them normal troops, right? Because there's something about these guys, man. They like the, the, it's a, the thrill or, the, you know, they, they're, they've got no fear of anything. You know, that's what high pressure. Not everyone can t- handle high pressure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, 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 that's human beings, you know? So right. anyway, it's almost like too, you know, you, you hear the argument in analytics. Well, you know, these guys that we used to say all the time, we, certain guys driving runs, man, when pressure, when the, when the, that time yeah. of the game, they come, you know what? 
they don't they don't uh, cringe they don't fold whatever it is and, and the argument on that side is no it's a product of more opportunities than uh, the other ones i said I said no it's not okay yeah yeah if they're hitting they're hitting in the middle of the lineup for a reason because yeah they get more opportunities but they've proven that's where they can be right and so there's some uh when you take the human element out of it and you go strictly numbers, that's what you come up with, you know? Uh, but in, I don't know. No, I love it. That's great. And honestly, Gibby, we're, we're just so happy with how generous you are being with your time. I know we're down to our last 15 minutes. So if we don't flip the no, list, no, we're, stretch, here. We're, stretching, we're stretching an hour. I, I get, okay. Really appreciate minutes. that. Yeah, All right. Too much, you know? All right. <laughs> well, let's flip to the list of questions anyways, because I'm sure that'll take up all the time we've got here. Adam, on right. to oh, you, yeah, my guy. You. Yeah. All right. So first one comes in from Garth. Garth says, uh, okay. Garth I wanna, what's that? Yeah. Garth Brooks, the one and only. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Gibby. Uh, Garth Orgy here from Twitter. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what was it like? being teammates with Doc Gooden back in the mid eighties and uh, like, just like, what was it like to be around him and, and strawberry and Keith and, and Gary and all those great players, but specifically Doc Gooden, because he was just so incredible in, in that 85 and 86 seasons. So uh, yeah, thanks for answering. Well, you know what uh, it, you know, Doc and I, uh, both made the, the Mets opening day roster in 1984, right? When they called it, even had articles called the G-Men, Gooden and Gibbon, right? One guy had a much better playing career. You know, <laughs> after, after, I mean, did, you know, his life got turned upside down. The other guy, not much of a playing career, but got into coaching, right? Hey, there you go. And, uh, you know, I, I see Dwight every now and then when they, they'll have some kind of like reunion from the 86 Mets. You know, I was there for two months and, and, uh, and some car, uh, autograph cards shows, that kind of thing one of the best guys you'll ever meet, you know, and it, and it's really sad, you know, what, what's, ha what happened to him. Cause he, he, he would give the shirt off your back. He would do anything you ever needed. Right. But he came along, you know, doc, I can remember him showing up in spring training and young kid, you know, and he's he got all this hype, right. He, he uh, anyway, and you could see, you could just see there was some, obviously he had, to, he had a great arm, but there was just something about this guy. Confidence It's like, we're talking about closers. He was confident. In the uh, in a great athlete, he had everything going for him, right? It's kind of, but kind of interesting story. In uh, what was it, eighty three? I was in Jackson, Mississippi, in Double A Texas League, and he was with the Lynchburg Mets team in the Carolina League, um, high A ball. In in uh, I think what happened is beginning of the year he was well maybe the first month or so he was he was just kind of sputtered, you know, not doing much. In the in the, the story we got, you know, from you know and everybody in the organization said. He was at the point where they were going to send him down to low A ball because he, I mean, he wasn't doing much, you know. And so the pitching coach went out there. I think it was John Cumberland, a really good pitching coach, went out there one time to the mound. And, and, and basically, in and the word I got is he told me it's time to shit or get off the pot, kid. Right? <laughs> and, 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 he, and you know what? And Doc just, you know, whatever, I don't know if that's what did it. Or, I mean, it's, it's something clicked, right? And then he goes on, he strikes out 300 guys in A ball. I mean, in minor league season, it's like, and they check out, he, I don't know, did he win the 18, 19 games? I don't know. Check out his 1983 season. In the, so, anyway, he, it was like, uh, and that's the story we got. You know, they, well, we, they might send him down, you know, because he's, and all of a sudden something set him off, right? So, that, that year in 83, he got called up to AAA at the end of the year, and I was still in AA. And then back then, they had a, a AAA. World Series. It was a true Triple A World Series. You had the you know International League, which we we're in, and the American Association Pacific Coast League. The three teams got together in Louisville, Kentucky, and played a round robin for the you know. So, Doc. So our our Triple A team in Tidewater, you know, won the won the league. So they went there. So Doc was went up there with them, and then I had finished my season in Double A and went home for a week. And they called and said, you know, Mike Fitzgerald, who, who ended up playing getting traded to the Expos for Gary Carter back in uh, 84, I think it was, he uh, he got called to the big league, so they needed a catcher. So they uh, they called me there. They called me up. In the, so that's when we first got together and we actually played together. And I got to catch him at ESPN covering the game. I think it might have been the championship game. Anyway, uh, can you guys still see me on here? My phone? Yeah, you can you're see all you. good. Uh, yeah, uh, it, It's my wife, and, and I'm not answering the phone. It's, it's clicking <laughs> on. And I thought, and, uh, she's got, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> That's some explaining to do, right? He's like, oh, he's probably talking baseball again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that was, you know, so then we both, we go to spring training the next year uh, in 84. And he he's 19. I was 21 at the time. And, the, you know, the team had been bad. The Mets had been bad, but they had a lot of good prospects come along, right? So Davey Johnson, the manager, and he wants to give us both the shots. We both make the team. And so I caught Doc a couple of times, and then I ended up getting injured and, and uh, getting sent back down eventually. But uh, that's, how, that's how I got, you know, uh, I guess my point of my story is this guy was a, a treat to catch, man. You know I mean? He's just uh, a, a, a young kid that just – I mean, you know, it was one of those generational guys. The league hadn't seen one of those guys in a long time, right? So, and then uh, – but – one of the best guys you will ever want to meet, you know, and then, but then, you know, I mean, uh, along with strawberry, you know, they ran together, you know, in uh, um, New York, tough town. And especially when the team's good, you know, and they, and the, they both got caught up and they, you know, made some bad choices and, mm -hmm. you know, it, you know, it, you know, it, it hurt them. Right. Obviously they both have been going in the hall of fame, but yeah. um, then eventually they both ended up playing with the Yankees and all that. But it, uh, you know, everybody think, you know, I think what everybody thinks well, maybe what Doc Gooden's been through, he, he'd be kind of some bad, bad dude, and blah, blah, whatever. Nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. He'd do something for you and anybody. You'd met. He's that kind of guy, you know. Um, and and, and, and cool. it was a thrill. I just I just wish that when the G men they were talking about had come through and I got to catch him a few more times. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't All work. Right. Doesn't, hey, life doesn't always flip. No, right? <laughs> it doesn't always want. go the way you want. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. Only one of you has a podcast now, so it worked out all right. That's right. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna get, him, I'll get him. I'll get him on there. Though. Hey, there yes, you go. You should. Good Heck yeah. Good one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, next one comes in from Connor. Connor says, "Hey, Gibby. Uh, my name's Connor, and my question for you is: in when it comes to the 2015 and 2016 teams, we always hear about a lot of the same guys like JD, Jose, Tulowitzki, etc." But for you, who was a guy that not enough people talked about on those teams? Thanks. Uh, okay, you know, uh, you know who had a big year. You know, did you say Russell Martin? Did you say Russell, Martin? Russell Martin? Nope. Yeah, you know, hey, Ru Russ was the, you know, Ru Russ is the backbone. You know, you know, the catcher back there. And, and uh, I tell you, tell you the truth, when when uh, when they brought in Donaldson and Russell, they they uh, not only I mean they were they every year they. Were, their teams would go to the playoffs, right? So, so they knew they knew what winning was. And basically, our team we didn't have anybody that been through, you know, been on winning teams, right? And that's and that's big. And they also added toughness to our team, you know, which I think we needed. Uh, you know, they both had grit, you know, dirty guys that got played the game hard and all that. Um, so you know, Russell was the backbone. Uh, but Chris Colabello, I think he gets kind of lost. You know, he he. Uh, you know, he ended up having that uh, testing positive, for, you know, mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. uh, but but that 15 season, that dude got more big hits for us. And, um, uh, you know, he, uh, you know, it's funny. We were down, we we're in a playoff game. That playoff game, we lost the first two games of the Rangers, right? And then we, mm -hmm. now we got it at home. So we're going down there to play. And I, and I you know, I had no doubts in my mind because we were, you know, we were a confident team. We were relaxed. It went. I went. We went down there. It was like no big deal, you know. We thought we could do it. We knew we were too good to bow out three straight, right? So we got the we got the practice day down. You know, get off. They taking BP, and uh, I can remember sitting around the cage and Calabello hitting the group. You know, Donaldson. You know, all the big hitters, middle of the lineup hitters. You know, and then everybody's laughing and joking and guys and talking about. You know, we're talking about home runs. He's got the most power and all that. And you know, uh, Calabello. You know, he he. He was he was a pretty good hitter, but he also had some pop, you know. And uh, so he some guys are hitting some home runs, and he he hits a home run to you know the ball flew in right field and down there in Texas, the old stadium, and he hits one out there, and, and it's back and forth, and he was, it says to me something about, I got the most power on this team, blah 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 whatever. And I, I might have said something like prove it or something like that, right? <laughs> so then we go then we go to that, that next game, game three or some sure he hits a home run out there, you know, and it, you know, it come, <laughs> comes in the dugout or whatever it was, and says, hey, yeah, there you go, you know. So, so in the, the heat of the moment, you got one one game to one game to winner, you go home, you know, and he's laughing. He tell me, hey, hey, what do you, hey, what do you think, Skip? What do you think? I told you, I was, you know, it's like <laughs> that's kind of the mentality of that group and the, the reason they, you know, oh, they were able to relax. But so the, the, there's there's two of them right there. Um, 
You should have told him to prove it sooner, Gibby. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, actually, he did all season long, man. Yeah, he you know, did. He really did. That's you true. Know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe you should have tried that in one of those first two games we played. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, let's all let's right. see. You know, on that, uh, you know, with Strowman, you mentioned Strowman. No, didn't mention Strowman. Huh? Did you mention? Did not Stroman? mention Strowman on this you know, list. Strowman played some big big games. You know, yes, in, he did. Uh, back then but you always thought of the core like you said uh donaldson batista and carnacion because those are the big three you know mm-hmm, yeah but you know but uh, teams that win good really good teams it's got to be a supporting cast of really good players you know totally. and uh yeah that 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 was that was a good... and then aaron sanchez man you know sanchi uh you know we made he came off the minor leagues and we made him a bullpen guy and he dominated, you know, and then, then we, he goes back to starting at 16. I think he won the ERA crown and had the blister problems. But he, he was kind of unheralded. You know, Cecil, mm-hmm. Brett Cecil, he, you know, we lost him in the playoffs. He didn't get, get the shine there. But but he was as dominant as any reliever that helped us get to the ball to us sooner to close out some big games. So, you know, it was really a team full of guys stepping up, you know. Absolutely. Uh, Dino Navarro, man. Russell Martin took his, his yeah, place, right? That's yeah. right. Dino played great for us until then. Russell got there. He, he limited his time, but he was big. He was big, you know, in his part time role. He had to go on and on with these guys. Lots, you know? lots of supporting cast for sure. All right. Yeah. Thanks for that one. Uh, next one, then, while we're on the topic of Russell Martin, uh, comes in from Jen. She says, a Baseball few Jen says hello, by the way, Gibby. Baseball Jen. <laughs> Baseball Jen. All right. Hi, John. It's Jen Smith. It's so good to see you again on Twitter. I can't tell you how much joy you are bringing to fans through your interaction with them. Um, You can see behind me (laughs) some of the great moments in Blue Jays history during your tenure with the Blue Jays. And so I wanted to ask you a question uh, regarding an interaction that you did have on Twitter and regarding a a former member of that 2015-2016 Blue Jays team. Uh, about a week ago, you were asked whether or not you thought Russell Martin would make a good manager. And so I was hoping that you could just talk a little bit to fans about the importance of the catching position, why it is such a vital position on a baseball team, but also if you could explain why it is that catchers, including yourself, make such great managers. Thank you very much for your time. You know, I, I don't know for sure if they make better managers, but there, a lot of them do it, right? Uh, and, but I think an area that it really helps you, you know, ga- games are won and lost, you know, with pitching, right? You know, um, you can always outslug teams so many times, but the teams with the best pitching win in, 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 the, in the end. So a, as a catcher, that's your job, right? You know, dealing with it, r- running the pitching staffs, having a great feel for that. So I think that kind of makes it's a natural transition that uh, they're so used to working with pitchers. So when they, when they're sitting in the dugout, uh, although it's a different angle, you look from the side, you can you 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 can tell what's going on with this guy, right? Or or in my case, like if you got a really good catcher, like when Russell's back there and Navarro's back there, some of the you know we had some really good ones along the way, uh, Luke Maley and some of those guys. I would always ask those guys, hey, what do you think? Or I'd tell them, hey, listen, when when you when you notice he start to lose it. You let me know too. I, I'm I'm seeing what I'm seeing, but you're sitting there looking at head on, and you can you you got that feel, man. You're catching it. You let me know. And so they'd always mention to me. They might say, "Hey, you're gonna come in after Douglas." He listen. He's starting to lose a little bit. In the see, that's what you can do with great catchers, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then like, and as far as Russell, Russell's probably made too much money, man, to want to do that crap. You know? <laughs> but but, I, but I, I can remember now, and I always used to see Joe Torrey always used to do it like at the end of the season he. Let one of his players, like you'd say, manage the game, right? But Joe would sit in the dugout. And I, th- I think he told him what to do, and they go out and change whatever. So after, after I knew I was gone, and we we played the last game in Toronto, we had a, a three game series down in Tampa to finish off eighteen. I said, I said, I'm gonna let Russell manage this game, man. You know, because he wasn't playing anyway that final month. You remember with Jansen, those guys came up, and so we wanted to see what you know, give him some playing time. So Russell said, Hey, I'd love to do it. You know, in the 
I said, all right, but I, you know, I'm, and I said, but I'm not gonna do it like Tori is. I said, I ain't, I'm not going near that bench, man. It's your game. <laughs> you and Pete Walker to pitch and coach. You guys have fun with it and do whatever. So my final day, I didn't even take my clothes off, put a uniform on, man. I just sat in that <laughs> office watching on TV and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's and then, uh, but, but, but Russ, if that's his desire, you know, there's, there's no question in my mind. He would, he would be one of the best. And, uh, but I, like I said, I don't know if he wants all the headaches. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, uh, a few more to get to here. Next one comes in from Trevor Freeman. Uh, he says, hey, Gibby, big fan. My question is, in the modern game, has bunting become an impossible skill to master with the velo and spin rate? Or would you still consider it to be a baseball fundamental? And then secondly, why do you hate one-run games so much? Why do I hate them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, were, were, were we that bad at him or what? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> you know, hey, and, and uh, what's bunting anyway? What is that? What is that? What is bunting? <laughs> what is bunting? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him to explain himself. Now, right. you know, yeah, that's disappeared from the game. You know, that goes back to uh, the old uh, money ball, you know, where don't give up, don't give away way outs. Um, and then, of course, then, you know, as it moved on to analytics, you know, the, the percentages say, you know, the number of times you'll get a hit there. And so why give up an out or blah, blah, whatever. Right. And, uh, but there's still, there's still definitely a place, a place for it. You know, you, and you'll not, you, sometimes you'll notice a little bit more when teams get in the playoffs mm -hmm. every now and then they start breaking out the butt. They might not have done it all year. The only problem with that is the guys haven't done it all year. You know, yeah. so now you're calling on him, you know, after seven months, he laid down a butt and go, what? the hell you know i didn't have to do it all year <laughs> so that, that's pressure but in the yeah the way the style they pitch now they try they throw a lot of the high riding four seam fastballs uh that makes it that, that definitely makes it tougher because you know it's easy, it's a ball up in the zone with something on it. it's much easier to pop up you know especially when you're not skilled at doing it all the time like they used to like they used to do in the old days you know so uh yeah I, I, it's definitely a lost art whether it comes back or not. Um, Analytics probably. will tell us. <laughs> it's right. It's right. right. But probably not. But you know what? But, but keep an eye on this postseason. See if anybody breaks it out. You, know, you probably you would have known 100% that they would have done it, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. Now, now um, you know, it'd be interesting you know, how many bunts were actually laid down this year in baseball, you know. Everybody goes bunch. What's a bunch? You know, <laughs> but right. sometimes you know what? You know, then something. You know, there's so many more. There's so many more ways to score when a guy on third base less than two outs, and you know, you don't always need a hit. Contact does it, so it makes perfect sense sometimes. That guy on second base, you know, tough guy on the mound, tough guy. You know, even you're trying to hit, hit the ball to the right side to get him over. Get him to third base. Something might happen, especially too if you're buttoned to the guy you want at the plate. The, the, those RBI guys, those yeah. guys that yeah don't grow on trees, man. Those guys that <laughs> like this, the steady eddies, their heartbeats. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, next one comes in from Joel. Oh, it's not every day you get to ask a Toronto Blue Jays legend like John Gibbons a, a question. So this is this is a big day for me. It might just you know today it's what. Tuesday for John Gibbons, but for me, it's a big day. Um, my question has to do with kind of uh, a managerial approach. Um, this year seems to be a year where offense is a little bit lower, pitching is, is dominating the league, scoring's a little bit lower. Uh, if you were the manager of the Jays, you'd come off the previous season where uh, I think we were leading the league in home runs. You see how the, the, the atmosphere of the league changes and the offense is lower. You can't really rely on home runs this year. Would you be able to call an audible midseason and like the way Terry Francona may have done in, in Cleveland and go for a more contact approach, a more old school approach because OPS is so low, you can't rely on the home run? Or do you just sit there and rely on your, your game plan from day one? I guess that's my question. It took me a minute to ask it. I apologize. Well, you know what the, the the thing is in 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 the big leagues, right? You know the the your team is what it is. The GM signs certain guys, whatever. And these guys these guys are either they're they're sluggers, or they may be contact guys, or you know, just guys that are glove guys that can't hit at all, right? <laughs> so if if you got a, if you got a guy that you know the 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 big sluggers, that's who they are. I mean, you know that to to tell them all of a sudden. We want you to, you know, shorten up, be a contact guy. That, that just doesn't happen. You know, it used to be, it used to be years ago that 
even even your guys that were known as the sluggers, your, your guys that hit the most home runs, and you know, even, look at a guy like Hank Aaron, right? He was just a great hitter, right? You know, like Willie Mays, a lot of those guys. You know, in, in the uh, you know, it's funny, real quick. Let me throw this in here real quick. Davey Johnson, when he managed the Mets, speaking of Hank Aaron, um, we we're standing around the cage one day, and he was talking about hitting, right? I was struggling or something. In the he played with Hank Aaron uh, in Atlanta. And that was a year, I think there was uh, Aaron, him, and then uh, one other guy hit like 40 home runs, right? Davey did as a second baseman. But he was telling me, he said, he said, that, you know, and Hank was, was the greatest home run hitter ever, right? And he said, he, he was saying, you know how, he asked me, do you know how Hank Aaron took BP? And I said, no, how? And he goes, well, it's first round, he just hit some ground balls. He played a little pepper with the second baseman, right? Next round, he might turn up a little bit. He hits some ground balls harder, and he starts hitting some line drives. Then his next round, he hit more line drives. And then, then his final rounds, like he might turn it up a little bit and, and pop a couple out of the ballpark, but he was always working on his hitting, his hit stroke, hitting line drives, right? And then the guys, there's the greatest home run hitter of all time and one of the greatest RBI guys of all time. But nowadays, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's it's different. You watch BP a lot of times. They might ha- they'll have their routines, their – fundamental rounds, get them over, get them in, that kind of stuff. And then it's usually Jack City, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but what's interesting, I, I heard, um, and I thought, yeah, that's perfect. There's a great center of all time, or arguably the greatest center combination. But I, when I was coaching with Kansas City, I was around the batting cage one day, and we were playing, uh, Jim Tomey was there. I'm not sure, he, he might have done with the White Sox. I think he wasn't with Cleveland anymore. I think he came to town with the White Sox. And we had this uh, hitter on our team, Kai Hui, uh, this, this big kid that had a lot of power potential. And I can remember he was he was hitting in the group when I was with the Royals and we were taking BP. And Kai Hui was hitting, and Tommy walks out and he's around the cage and he's he's probably the most one of the most lovable guys that would talk to anybody, right? And I can remember hearing him tell Kai Hui, you know, since in BP you got to practice hitting home runs. If you're a home run here, you got to practice hitting them, right? And Tommy hit like five, six hundred, six hundred. I don't know, he hit a ton, right? So there, but there's a difference, right? You know, I heard, I heard the manager play, play with Hank Aaron said Hank never hit home runs in BP. <laughs> he worked on his swing, right? Then you get, I hear Tommy, another one of the, you know, greatest home run hitters ever said, no, you got to practice that. That's what you do, <laughs> you know? So I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. All I can tell you to answer your question is, yeah, you'd love to be able to tell him to cut your swing down and, and the ball is not flying, blah, blah, blah. And, and that, but it's not that easy to do. That's why I think the best teams, you know, they, they have, they have, they're sluggers, but they have enough guys in that are just good hitters, the fundamental hitters, and line drive guys that get on base that way. Or because um, you know, you think if you think about it, you know, if say you know the great hitters get five hundred bats a year, right? In a, in a huge home run year is what? Let's say forty home runs. So that's what that's uh, four hundred sixty other at bats. We ain't hitting the home run, man. You better be doing something. Yeah. So you better, you know, you, you need it. And you know what else too is kind of. Eat. I, I notice it all the time. Um, guy, guys will get up, you know, you see statistics, their stats come up at the end of the year. And it says, well, this guy's got 20 home runs. He's got like 40 something RBIs. And it's like, so he's not driving in a whole heck of a lot of runs other than if he's not hitting a home run. Right. Yeah. We're, we used to be a guy hit, this guy's got 20, 25 home runs. He's probably sitting around 70, 80 homers, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, RBIs at the time. RBIs. You know? uh, so, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know what your answer is. So maybe part of it too, you know, the, the the juice ball. I think that's that's been a little different this year. The home runs and everything are down. So, but you know, these guys are what they are. It's it's, it's not like you can change all the time. And the the, the games encourage home runs, man. You know, fans love to see it. it it's proven the teams that win hit the most home runs. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can argue that all you want, but you know, that's what it is. Somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna throw that at you. Yeah. I mean, I sure loved watching Batista, Edwin, and Bringer of Rain just hit bombs all 2015. That was pretty fun. <laughs> exactly. Hey, you no, know, another thing, real quick. I'm just rambling. Sorry. The, 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 I was watching the, with the game um, when Anaheim was in town in Toronto. Was it a few weeks ago? In, in yeah. uh, Manoa was facing Otani, right? Yep. That was a big matchup. Great game. And uh, Otani was hitting and like he tried to lay down a bunt, right? And, uh, he, he, and plus, he's also the fastest guy in the league, I think. And he just barely missed it. And everybody's going, well, great. And, but I'm thinking, guys on Toronto team are going, thank you very much, man. This guy's, you know. Yeah. He's please. not going to hit away. a home run by doing that. <laughs> and he gave us an out, you know. And it's like, 
so there's your argument. You know, ideally, you know, he was thinking I need we need a base runner and he can fly. And, but his strength is home run. So I don't know. I don't know who I don't know who's right. Or wrong. I don't know. I'm not buying any tickets to a Cardinals game to watch Albert Pujols lay down a bunt. That's for exactly. <laughs> tell you. And you know, not this year. Donaldson did that one time, one year. And I don't know if it was a, a runner or two on. He laid down a bunt to get the guy in scoring position, get him to third. And he might have been struggling at the time. And I'm going, well, what's he doing? This might have been his MVP year, right? <laughs> I'm going, I'm going hey, you're, you're, the, you're the best hitter in the league right this year. You got all these home runs and swing the bat, you know? But it was like he was trying, and it was kind of a, a mixed reception. People thought, oh, that's the greatest thing in the world. You know, he's what, selfless. What a team guy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the ultimate team guy. And I and I, I said to him later, joking, I said, Well, you're struggling so bad, you're protecting yourself or something, or what? You're, 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 <laughs> you're trying looking for a sack butt. So, you know, you, know, you already got your one hit today, so you'd be one for three instead of one for four. You know? <laughs> so, anyway. Uh... All right. So there's a big argument on both sides. There you go. All right. Well, we have one time for one last quick question here. So I want to get this in. This comes from Ian. It says, who would you prioritize extending this off season first? Or maybe not this off season, but who would you prioritize extending first? Uh, Bo or Vladdy or perhaps Alec Manoa? How about all three of them? Yes. They got the, they got the money, man. Don't mind that argument. <laughs> they ain't got the money for crying out loud, you know? <laughs> All right. No, uh, gosh, I mean, sooner or later, they get you, you hope they, you know, I, when I, when I say that, I mean, it is a business and there is limitations, obviously. Right. You know, mm-hmm. it's a, yeah, I can remember as, as coach, as a coach or as a manager, we tell our, the front of these, you know, get, get this guy, get this guy, you know, it ain't my money, man. <laughs> and you, we want, we want everything. Right. But there's limitations, budgets, what have you. But I think it's essential to the, to the organization to sign those three guys yeah. um uh yeah you know because i mean really the three cornerstones you know the uh, it was kind of interesting I, when i first got on this social media stuff i was getting all these these uh tweets of people tell me what's wrong with bo you know he's his defense stinks you know he's not hitting like he was <laughs> last year and i'm thinking yeah you guys are you guys are going to a first you guys are going to a uh play in a playoff spot if the game ended right now and I looked at his numbers and his numbers aren't that bad. Plus <laughs> I, the home runs are down. So maybe it's the ball, whatever, you know? Yeah. So anyway, uh, and I made the comment, you know, just cheer him on, man. And let, you know, let the front yeah. office worry about where he plays next year. Yeah. And then, you know, and then not long after that, you see me, he, he catches fire and he's, and he's leading the, all these games. And it's, and it's, and he drove in a hundred runs as a shortstop last year. He's going to do it again this year. It's like, he, you know, it's almost like how quickly they forget. Right. But well, now those same also, Twitter accounts are are being like, "What's wrong with Vladdy? Can't he hit like Bo?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then a week later, they go, "What's wrong with Bo? Can't he hit like Vladdy?" You know? <laughs> and it's like, so, so you know, it's uh, but that's that's the sports world. That's you know, that's the beauty of baseball, man. You know, uh, we can be fans. We can we can dissect the info, whatever we want, and uh, you know, so many different ways to do things. But but you know. I, Bo, if you put put him on the trademark, 20 other, 29 other teams would, would want him, right? Oh, yeah. So sometimes you got to appreciate what you got. You got to look at it a little more deeply. And I, and I get it. He may not be the gold glove shortstop type. Well, but he ain't too – he's pretty damn good still. And, you know, when mm-hmm. you combine that with his offense, he's going to give you – you know what? Would you rather have, like, that piss-ant shortstop that he makes all the plays, but he but he can't hit a lick and you got to pinch hit for him in the sixth inning, because if, you know? Yeah, know, Which guy would you rather have? Now, well, you, now in the ninth inning, when the, when you got a one run lead, a couple guys on, you'd want that piss and shortstop out there. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I, all I know is I don't want to see Bo or Vlad bunting in the next two months. I'll tell you that. Oh right. gosh! Oh yeah. If, if, that, <laughs> right. if, that, if that happens, Schneider should get fired. <laughs> there you go. Or the, or the hidden coach, or the yeah. you know whoever. Clean house. Yeah. Gibby, I know we're pushing our luck here. Do you mind if we slide one more listener question hey, into you? Ahead, for- yeah, hey, all right. Hey, I'm enjoying it. You know, we can go a couple more. All right. Uh, all right. Last listener question then uh, comes from Capris. It says, what, the J- what should the Jays do this offseason? Uh, the catcher position, the DH log jam, the lack of lefties, more big-time pitchers for the rotation. Yeah, you know, I, I can guarantee you what they're thinking up there. Hey, we got everything you just named off right there. 
You know, you start with the catching position. You know, he, he got J- Jansen, Kirk, and who, who's, the, who's their big prospect down in uh, Moreno. Moreno or something like that? Yeah. yeah, Moreno, okay. yeah. So you got two really good ones in the big leagues. You know, Kirk having a great year with the bat. You know, Danny Jansen, you know, Danny does both. You know, he's he's the he's a defensive specialist, but Danny gets some big hits, right? And, you know, I haven't seen Marino pitch, I mean, play, but they say he's a top, their top guy. So they, they, uh, you know, I don't think you need a catcher. Um, as far as pitching goes, uh, you know, you got Gossman, you got Manoa are set right there. Stripling's kind of come into his own, right. Mm-hmm. And been, been, I don't know if he's a surprise, but he's been huge for him. Oh. You know, the, the mystery is, is, uh, uh, Rios. Yeah, Barrios, but he's he's proven, right? This is just kind of an, uh, one of the crazy oh, years dear. for him, hopefully. And then Rue and, and the other guy, you know, uh, you hope they bounce back. I think Rue had they have Tommy John or John. Yeah, or Tommy John. Yeah. Yeah. So so and they're spending they spent a ton of money on those guys, right? So there's not a whole lot of you know. When, when you just asked me a while ago, that guy, would you sign them Manoa? You're, You're like they have lots of money. <laughs> How much money do you think they left? You know. Uh, uh, Maybe that guy that owns the Mets, he might do it. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so then uh, DH, I think they like the way their DH works because they're able to rotate guys in and out. Um, uh, you know, Springer, when he gets banged up, you know, you can put him there, but you can give him guys a day off and let him just DH. I think that works perfectly for him. Uh, and I don't think – I don't know if there's any big hammers out there that uh, – you know, on the, on the market that are D, strictly DHs. And that's kind of – you know what the, the – I don't know if it's common in baseball. That's kind of Blue Jays' philosophy now. Got get a lot of versatile guys. So. Bullpen wise, um, that's what he meant by left-handers. You know, you got Mesa down there. I don't know. If I think it, I think it was lefty bats. He was asking about how oh, important is a lefty oh, bat. I will tell you that. I will tell you this because we battled the same thing when I was there. I complain all the time. We need more. We were. Uh, uh, I think we might have had one left-handed bat in the lineup. You know, we were really good right-handed. But you know, if you were a team cup came into town. I mean, you talk about easy way to set up your bullpen. I mean, you just got all right handers, right? If you got yeah. and generally bullpens where well, you might have one or two lefties max. So now hey, it's it's like uh I mean it's like an easy day for the opposing manager. It may not work, it may not win, but he just keeps running them right handers out. And so uh, yeah, I, I think that's important in uh you know the the key, the key is but who what who, what spot is it gonna take? You know, your 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 top dogs, you know, or your right handed thumpers, right? Uh, but there's no doubt if any, if anything, you know, it just puts a thought on the other manager's mind, you know, to have that, um, you know, I have that guy, but, but we were in the same boat and I do think it hurt us. It would have helped us more with more left-handers. No question about it. So I understand that argument a hundred percent. Amazing. Gibby, we've just had a blast chatting ball with yeah, you, man. Me too. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time really appreciate it can't wait to listen to your podcast that starts next week right tuesday the further then it's going to be the mondays after that we uh i think going on tuesday uh out of respect for the queen of england right because it's the, i think it's the day that's right. that's that's, uh, that's uh i guess that's the right thing to do right there you go there you yeah. go so, so anyway uh yeah we'll, we'll see how it goes you know, I hope you guys listen, and uh, I'd love to come back. You know, I'll get you on my show, man. We'll throw yeah, it we'd love going, to be on the know? show, man, and we love. We would love to have you back. Absolutely. Hey, I've enjoyed it, man. And uh, you got you guys take care. Anytime you need anything, you holler. Okay, tell the fans right. thank you. Will do. Thank Absolutely. you so much.